I'm sure that all of us find that today's life is very busy. And it seems like we do not have enough time to do all of the things that we would like to do. Nor do we have enough time to do the things that we know that we should do. What is the first thing that you cut down on or eliminate when you don't have enough time to do all of these things? At least I presume that most of us don't have time to do the things that we would like to do or that we know that we should do. I doubt that very many of us find that we have plenty of time for everything because we live in a very complex society where there are many things that demand our time. We don't have the simple life that maybe some of our ancestors had. And so it's rush, 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 it seems like. So what do you eliminate or what do you cut down on when you don't have enough time for everything? Do you cut down on the time you spend eating or cut down on uh, what you eat? <clears throat> I would rather doubt it. Or do you cut down on sleep? Some people do that. Most don't. But uh, some do cut down on sleep to the detriment of their health. Do any of us cut down on uh, the time we spend on the job? Most of us don't. We try to put in more time instead of less time. <clears throat> Or do we cut down on the amount of time that we spend with a family? Some of us may do that, again, to the detriment of our family. Or do we cut down on Bible study and prayer, or Bible study or prayer? And I dare say that this is the area where most of us cut down if we don't have enough time. And so, as a result of this, some have confessed to us in the ministry from time to time that uh, because of various reasons, including the lack of time, that some haven't prayed for days, or they haven't prayed for weeks, or they haven't prayed for months, and some have even said, well, well I haven't prayed for years. In fact, I had a man recently tell me, a man who had graduated from Ambassador College, <clears throat> had been in the church for several years, he says that I haven't prayed for four years. Now, I'm speaking, of course, of regular prayer, regular daily prayer, prayer on your knees. I'm not talking about uh, maybe the uh, brief prayers. I would hope even those people would uh, offer up on, uh, rare, on other occasions, possibly. But it seems like that there are a few among us who apparently rarely, if ever, think very much about prayer except that is when they're in trouble. Our God tells us, and I'm sure this is very familiar, from Isaiah 55, verse 6 through 9, he says, Seek you the eternal while he may be found. Now, you've all heard that scripture, I'm sure, on many occasions. But do you realize that there is a time coming when it may be too late for some of us to pray? Or where that relationship of prayer with God no longer exists and there is no longer a channel or a vehicle or a way of communication to God. Because there comes a time when, depending on circumstances, God may close the door, when he will not listen any longer. We read, for example, in a couple places in Revelation, things relating to God's temple in heaven, and one specifically uh, tells us that for a time that God's temple is closed in heaven. Now, just exactly what this means, uh, I don't know that I can say dogmatically and finally without doubt or question, but I sort of imagine what it's conveying to us is that at that particular time, God says to the world, I'm going to close up shop now. I'm not going to listen to your prayers any longer. Just as uh, ancient Israel, <clears throat> there came a time, I'm thinking uh, more particularly rather of Judah, but I'm sure the same thing happened of Israel, that uh, God said, for example, to Jeremiah, don't pray for this people any longer because I won't hear your prayers. Now here was uh, God's servant, God's uh, uh, prophet for that particular time, and God says, don't pray for this people any longer because I won't even listen to you. Even though you are my servant and you've been faithful all of these years, if you pray for this people, I won't listen. And how much more so would he not listen to Judah at that particular time when they cried out in prayer? Now, why was this? 
Well, it was because that God had sent his prophets. He had pleaded with Judah and previously with Israel over a period of uh, centuries even to follow his ways. They had not, and so now came the time for punishment, and so he had closed their ears to their cries. And that same thing can happen to us as well. I'd like to turn back to that place, Isaiah 55, because there are some other comments there that go along with it that I would like to uh, read and comment about. <clears throat> Isaiah 55. It says, Seek you the eternal while he may be found. Call you upon him while he is near. And I think it's implied right there that there may be a time you see when he won't listen. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the eternal. So he's showing here that what we should do if we uh, are not calling upon God is that we begin to do that, but we start out by obeying. And he, speaking of God, will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither your ways my ways. Now, if we were going to just go our ways, as far as the subject of prayer is concerned, I don't suppose we would pray very often. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. <clears throat> so how do we seek God? Well, we start out by forsaking our ways and our thoughts. In other words, repent and then call upon him. Well, now, how do you call? Upon God. Well, obviously, you call upon God in prayer. And that's what this sermon is going to be about about the subject of prayer. In fact, this will be a series, <clears throat> and hopefully, I can return in a couple of weeks and uh, continue either one or two additional sermons on the subject of prayer. A very important subject for any true Christian. And so, we might say that this sermon is all about prayer. Now, by being all about prayer, I'm not going to exhaust the subject, but I'm going to try to cover quite comprehensively all phases and facets, or at least the important phases and facets of prayer. Now, first, what is prayer? And I want to just very briefly say what prayer is, and uh, uh, this is not necessarily a Bible definition, but I think a rather obvious definition. Prayer is talking or conversing with God. This is the way, of course, that we can talk with God, the Creator. And he talks back to us by his word, and as we study his word. So that's, of course, a different aspect of the subject, but uh, we will not be, be covering, you know, about this, the fact of, that we should study. Now, another factor about prayer is, that prayer is an important part of worship. People talk about worshiping God. Uh, they talk, especially at this time of year, you know, about how they adore Jesus. And uh, yet, a part of worship is praying to God. I wonder how many of these people that say, you know, well, we adore the little babe away in a manger and so forth. I wonder how many of these people really pray to God. So that's basically what prayer is. It's just really talking to God. Then I would like to ask, why pray? Now, there are a lot of reasons, of course, why we should pray. I'll give you some of them. Because it's a way of expressing praise to God and thanks to God, to that great God for his blessings and for all of the understanding and knowledge that he has given us for supplying us with our physical needs, our spiritual needs, and, uh, you know, on and on and on and on, are the many things that God has blessed us with. Now, some people, of course, are very unappreciative of the blessings that they receive from God. Others don't even recognize that some of the good things they have do come from God. Now, a year or two ago, and I can't uh, recall whether it was one or two years ago, during the uh, Thanksgiving season, I had a sermon on the subject of Thanksgiving. And I think that I uh, spoke on that subject here. I may be wrong, but I think that I did. And uh, anyway, if I did, I spent the whole time, the whole sermon, about things we can thank God for that we should be thanking God for. So, so many are first unappreciative and then also 
do not acknowledge or recognize all of the many good things that they have that do come from God. Now, another reason for prayer is that we might have an opportunity to intercede for others, to be uh, an intercessor, just as Jesus Christ is now. And uh, I will cover that point again a little bit later in a little different context. So it's an opportunity to uh, intercede for others before God, to express concern to God for others. And really that gives us experience now in what we'll be doing, at least in part, in the world tomorrow, in interceding with God for those that are going to be under us in God's kingdom, just as Christ is doing that now. Now another reason for prayer is that we can ask for help. And that help, of course, any kind of help, physical help, spiritual help, or whatever, we can ask God for guidance and for strength and for whatever else it is that we may need. Now, another reason why we pray is that this is the only way that we have to communicate with our great God and Creator. So, very briefly, those are some of the reasons as to why we should pray. Great benefits result in the right kind of prayer. And, of course, for many of us, we haven't yet learned how to pray properly. And maybe we're not receiving very many benefits as a result of our prayer. The next question I would like to ask is, how should we pray? And there are many phases and facets of this particular point that I would like to elaborate on. How pray? I'm reminded of a a saying of Benjamin Franklin, which appeared in... uh, Poor Richard's Almanac, back in the 18th century, 1757, which uh, gives us his idea relating to this and also another point. He says, your work as if you were going to live to be 100 years old. Work as if you were going to live 100 years. Pray as if you were to die tomorrow. And I thought that was uh, very good. Reminds me of something else that's uh, maybe... Not quite closely related to this, but it reminded me of something else. Uh, one man was uh, saying to another, uh, talking to him about his age. He was a real old man. I think that Mr. Rader had made some reference to this in regard to Mr. Armstrong. Anyway, the old fellow said, well, if I would have known I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of myself. You'd think we would take better care of ourselves so that we might live longer, but... It seems like too many of us are unconcerned until maybe it's too late. Anyway, we need to pray, according to Benjamin Franklin, as if you were to die tomorrow. And I think that's uh, rather good advice as far as that's concerned. Now, how pray? First, and even before you start to pray, there is something that we need to understand and know about. Otherwise, we really uh, are wasting our time in prayer. Because God won't hear us. Let's turn to Isaiah 59. We were in Isaiah 55, I guess it was. Let's turn over a few chapters to chapter 59. Verse 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Now, if you would go ahead and read most of the rest of the chapter, you'll find that he elaborates on the last part of this about the iniquities that had separated them from God, and so that God would not listen to them and uh, in their prayers. And so first, even before you pray, if you want God to hear your prayer, you have to obey God. Now, this is uh, put in different words in different parts of the Bible, and I will give you some of those places now shortly. So the first thing you need to do in regard to prayer is to obey God. And if you haven't, then the thing to do is to repent of your sins, of your wickedness, and start obeying God. And in doing that, then, you can have access to God and to his throne. But he's not going to hear you, he's not going to listen to you, if you are continuing on in your wickedness and in your sins. And of course, God is the one that de- defines what wickedness or what sin is. It's not you know, just what we may think sin is or is not, but what God says is sin. Now let's turn over to the New Testament 
to see this point brought out even further. John 9 and verse 31. John 9, 31. Now, in this particular case, the speaker is not Jesus Christ, but a man who had been healed of Christ. And uh, when he was questioned by the uh, Pharisees and uh, others, or the Jews, uh, here is a part of the answer that he gave them, which is based, of course, on what we just read back in... uh, the book of Isaiah, and also some other scriptures we're going to see shortly. This is now John 9, verse 31. Now we know that God hears not sinners. So if you want God to hear you, you have to quit sinning. And when you do sin, because of weakness or whatever, then you should repent of that sin and quit sinning. But if any man be a worshiper of God and does his will, him he hears. So if you want God to hear you in your prayer, you need to do God's will. Otherwise, he's not going to hear you, and of course you're wasting your time in prayer. So if you're rebelling against God and you're not obeying God and you're not praying, well, I guess that's understandable because God wouldn't hear you anyway. Now, let's notice a couple verses in the Psalms, actually both of them in the same chapter, Psalm 34, that touch on this point. Psalm 34. Psalm 34, and uh, starting in verse 15. The eyes of the eternal are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. So you see, God is watching Those that are righteous. Now, who are those who are righteous? Those who have repented of their sins. Those who have put sin out of their lives. Those uh, whose sins have been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so on. So, those people, those righteous, not because of their own goodness, but because of God's forgiveness. Those people are heard by God when they cry out in prayer. The face of the eternal is against them that do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. And then verse 17 is another point I want to emphasize. The righteous cry and the eternal hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Here again, though, it's the the righteous, the one that God is going to hear because he's not going to hear the unrighteous and the ungodly and the wicked. And it says he delivers them out of all their troubles. It doesn't say now that they're not going to have troubles. It just says that when they have troubles, God is going to deliver us from those troubles. Then in Proverbs, Proverbs 15, we'll find uh, again the same principle. Proverbs 15 and verse 29. Proverbs 15, 29. The eternal is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of of the righteous. Now, from those scriptures, I think it ought to be evident that even before we come to God in prayer, we need to settle up our account. We need to put sin out of our lives. We need to start obeying God. Otherwise, he is not going to hear us. So how should we pray first? Even before we pray, we have to go to God and have our sins forgiven and then obey God. Now, let me comment a little bit about what our attitude should be as we approach God in prayer. How should we approach God? Should we approach God with the uh, sort of attitude, you know, that here I am, God, and, uh, you know, I'm very important, and uh, I'm uh, this, that, and I'm the other thing. And so you come to God with uh, uh, bragging and with vanity and uh, with... uh, being puffed up, God isn't going to hear a prayer from someone like that. You know, if you think that you are so great and that you are better than other people, again, God isn't going to hear your prayer. Let's notice Psalm 9. Psalm 9. And verse 12. I think we only need a part of the verse here. The last part of the verse, it says, He forgets not the cry of the humble. <clears throat> He forgets not the cry of the humble. It ought to be uh, obvious as far as that's concerned, but we need to come to God with humility. 
And this is one scripture that shows that. So approach God in humility. Then, let's notice another aspect of this in Jeremiah 29. This is not now related to the subject of humility particularly. Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29. As far as what our attitude should be when we come to God. Jeremiah 29, verse 13. Now, in this particular case, he's talking to Judah, to the Jews who are in captivity, and tells them that after a certain period of time that God is going to visit them again, and uh, they're going to call upon him. Uh, verse 12, Then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will listen or hearken unto you. And you shall seek me and find me. When? When? When you shall search for me with all your heart. Now there he's speaking specifically to the nation of Judah, which are presently in captivity. But this is a principle that would apply to all of us. That when we seek God and we search for him, he will hear us when we pray to him with all our heart. In other words, you can't approach God in prayer when... uh, You know, you have your mind on other matters. You need to approach God where you devote your time and your attention intensely to God in that prayer. Not one of these uh, rote prayers where, you know, you you pray something from memory or you recite uh, something that you've heard that is uh, somebody else's prayer or that you read somebody else's prayer or as some of the The Orientals do to uh, have a prayer written on a prayer wheel, and you turn the prayer wheel and think that God is going to hear you, or that uh, you're going to repeat words over and over and over and over again, and you think that because of your much saying that God is going to hear you. No, you have to approach God in prayer with all your heart. You can't have your mind or your heart divided. You need to put your mind solely on what you're doing. And therefore, when we come to God in prayer, we need to get rid of all of the uh, outside uh, distractions or things that we might be concerned about. And uh, when we go to God in prayer, then, to seek him with all our heart. And it seems like, uh, at least I presume this is the case with most people, with when you first, especially when you first start praying, I mean, when you first start into the habit or trying to get into the habit of prayer to God, it seems like there's so many things that interrupt. And so many things that come to your mind. Oh, I forgot this, and I better go and run and do that. Oh, I forgot that, so I better go run and do that. So you get down on your knees, and then all of a sudden you think, well, I've got to do this. And then you come back and get on your knees. Oh, I've got to do something else. And so here you are running back and forth, uh, trying to do those things you should have uh, maybe taken care of ahead of time. Well, your heart is not really on God in such circumstances. We need to seek God with all our heart and put other things out of our mind. Of course, some of these things are not easy to do, but it reminds me of what the disciples said to Jesus, and we'll come to this quite a bit later in uh, this study. But they said, teach us to pray. Now, why teach us? Because it's something that we don't already know. It's something you have to learn, you have to acquire. It's not like falling off a log, you know. It isn't something you were inherently born with so that you can just easily and automatically do. Now, in this regard... Seeking God and praying to God with our whole heart, let's turn to James 5. This is a little more familiar, I presume. James 5, verse 16. Just before this, he had talked about those who were sick and what they should do. And continuing in the same theme, at the end of verse 16, and I'll just read a part of the verse here, he says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And I think conversely then that the ineffectual, unfervent prayer isn't going to avail very much. Probably nothing. So continuing really the same thing that I read back in the Old Testament. Seeking God with our whole heart or praying to God in an effectual, fervent prayer. But now what does it mean to pray an effectual, fervent prayer? I think that the English translation here doesn't convey fully 
what James had in mind when he wrote this. Well, let's take each of these words. First, the word effectual. Now, the word effectual here comes from a Greek word, Z-E-L-O-S. Zealous, I guess we would pronounce it. And we, of course, have a form of that same word that's been carried over into the English language. It means with zeal, or with ardor, or with fervent mind. And so he's saying here, the zealous, fervent prayer. Now, maybe that might be repeating the second word, fervent, which really is, again, is not a, a very uh, good translation into the English. The word fervent here comes from another Greek word, which we also use in a different form in English. Energeo, E-N-E-R-G-E-O, or we might say energy. Uh, it means active or efficient. So he's t- saying here now that if you want to have God answer your prayers, you need to have a zealous prayer with a lot of zeal and with a lot of energy. You know, put effort and energy into it. It's not just a sleepy time prayer, you know, now I lay me down to sleep and so on and so forth. And then maybe you fall asleep in the process. Do you think God's going to hear your prayer when you are there half asleep? Or when you fall asleep when you're praying? That's not the kind of prayer God's going to answer. Maybe it would be better to have that kind of prayer than to have none. But, uh, you know, if you want to have answers to your prayer, you really have to put your heart in your prayer. You have to do it zealously and with a lot of energy. Yes, the effectual fervent prayer and then of a righteous man, getting back to the point I mentioned earlier, that we need to obey God. That's the kind that avails much. And he goes on to give in his example, Elijah. Or, as it is in the King James, Elias. Now, Elias is just the Greek name for Elijah. So, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. He was just like you and I are. He had the same kind of uh, physical pulls in the wrong direction as we have. And it says, he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. Now, do you think that was a sleepy time prayer? No, you can be sure that he really put his heart in that prayer. It was a zealous prayer, filled with energy. He prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. So he put his heart in his prayer, you can be sure, otherwise God wouldn't have answered that prayer. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. And so even a man like Elijah, he had to pray fervently. He had to pray with zeal and with energy. Now, why aren't our prayers more this way? Why is it that we don't pray the effectual, fervent prayer? Well, I'll give you uh, my opinion as to what one of the major problems is. Because God seems unreal to most of us. He seems far off, even after we're converted. It seems like, you know, he's, he's in a world apart, and I guess you might say that literally. But God seems far off. But the problems, the around, the environment, you know, wherever we are, wherever we're praying even, you know, on the floor there, or the, the couch, or the chair, or the stool, and the walls, or the ceiling, you know, they're very real, aren't they? We see them right there with our eyes. And we feel them with our hands. And we hear things with our ears and so on. And here we are praying to God and God isn't in the room. God sometimes seems so far off to us. And the physical seems so real. But do you realize that the things that we see around us, the physical things, the things that seem so real... Those things are going to perish. They're not going to last very long. They're going to cease to exist. Now, on the other hand, the God that seems so unreal and seems so far off and seems so nebulous, he has lived forever and will live forever. Now, as we grow more spiritually, as we draw closer to God in our Christian life, God becomes more and more real to us. And then the present... The around, the physical, is seen more like it is. Transitory, temporary. It's not going to last very long. It's going to wear out. It's going to be destroyed. It's going to end. Now we need more awareness of that great God. 
and that there really is a God, and he really does hear our earnest prayers. We need to have more awareness of that, of that great God in our heart, rending prayers. We need to realize that when we come to God in prayer, that we are coming into his holy temple. And we, in a sense, have asked an audience, not with some worldly king or emperor or president or dignitary, but we have asked an audience with the creator of the universe. And we have asked and are supposedly coming into that holy temple of God in heaven unto indescribable majesty and glory such as we have never really seen. Into the presence of Almighty God, the creator and ruler of all. And maybe we need to think along this line a little bit before we even come to God in prayer. Realize now when I go to God in prayer, you know, I'm going to his throne in heaven. To a fabulous place of indescribable majesty and great power. You might say the uh, uh, power source of the whole universe. We're going within his, to, to his presence. And uh, hopefully that ought to keep us awake, you know, while we come to God in prayer to realize that we are there praying to that great God. Now, if we were going to appear before some worldly uh, dignitary or ruler, I'm sure we'd be wide awake. And we'd be very concerned about how we came and uh, the circumstances, maybe, that we came before that uh, great personage. Well, we ought to be more concerned when we come into God's presence. Now, how should we enter God's presence? We go up to God in, in, in prayer and say, God... I'm having a lot of trouble. And this is the problem, and that's the problem. Will you give me this, and will you give me that, and just everything negative, and give me, and so on and so forth. Is that the way we should approach God? Some people tell me, you know, well, I don't know what to pray about. And I suppose that the one reason they don't know what to pray about is because they approach God with that attitude. You know, one of complaint, or one of just asking for themselves. And there's so much to prayer beside that. Now, how should we enter God's presence? In prayer, let's turn to Philippians. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4. And verse 6. Be careful for nothing, and this is sort of a a poor King James translation. He's just saying here, don't worry. Uh, Don't worry about anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication... He's talking here about prayer and supplication, which is an intense prayer. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. So if you're going to go to God and ask of him certain requests, you need to go with thanksgiving. Enter God's presence with thanksgiving. And when you realize how much we owe God and how much he has done for us, there is so much we can be thankful for on a recent broadcast, uh, Mr. David Armstrong was on the subject of uh, tithing. Well, he didn't start out talking about tithing, uh, per se. Uh, he was talking about it indirectly. But he was saying how that, that really, we owe God everything, and all of our income is really his. You know, ten-tenths of our income belongs to God, because he's the one that gives us the air to breathe, that makes it possible for us to live, and the food that we have that makes it possible for us to live. He is the one that has created the whole universe. He is the one that has created us and set in motion all the laws and so forth. And therefore, if by our energy we produce certain income, really it belongs to God because all of the energy, all of everything, ultimately has come from God. And that God only requires that we give him 10% back, as he went on to explain somewhat later. In other words, when you realize that everything comes from God, we have so much to be thankful for. So we ought to come into God's presence with thankfulness. Now I'm reminded of another psalm that relates to this quite clearly. Let's turn to Psalm 100. Psalm 100. In this particular case, he's talking about uh, coming to the temple, but the principle applies to No matter how we uh, come into God's presence, in ancient times they came into his presence in the temple, but we come to God, into God's presence, among other things, in prayer. Psalm 100 and verse 4. 
Make a joyful noise unto the eternal, all you land. Serve the eternal with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know you that the eternal, he is God, and uh, it is he that has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Now, when we come into God's presence in heaven, we are entering in, in a sense, into his gates. Uh, anciently, of course, they had gates uh, that entered into the temple. And so that's what it's talking about specifically, but the principle applies today as well. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name, for the eternal is good, his mercy is everlasting, and uh, so forth. His truth endures to all generations. So we see, now, if we're going to come into God's presence, we need to come not with griping and complaining and negative thoughts and the gimmies, but enter into God's presence with thanksgiving. Giving God, God thanks for all of the many things that he has done for us individually and collectively. Now, another important point in our prayer to God, in going to God, and how to pray, is to go to God with faith, or in faith believing. That ought to be very obvious, of course, from many scriptures, but let's notice all two or three or four of them here, a couple of them maybe, relating to the subject of faith, and we'll see a little bit more in more detail about this subject. Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. And verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. If we're going to please God, we have to have faith. For he that comes to God, and when we go to God in prayer, we are coming to God, are we not? For he that comes to God must believe that he is. You know, we believe that there really is a God. It isn't some uh, ephemeral or ethereal nothingness but that there really is a God, and actually he's even more real than we are, because he lives forever and has all power, and we, in this physical life, do not last very long. must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You know, not one that just on a rare occasion seeks God, but one who diligently, and if you are diligent, that would seem to me imply that you're doing it very regularly, diligently seek him. Now to Mark 11, Mark 11, <clears throat> and uh, verse 22, Mark 11, excuse me, verse 24, therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. Now, if you think that whatever you ask of God, he isn't going to answer, uh, then of course he's not going to answer. Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, and this is a part of prayer, you know, to ask those things you desire, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. So, we see this principle that we, when we ask God of things, we must believe that God is going to answer those requests. And he has promised us certain things that he is going to do. As I said, we'll see this a little bit later again. In fact, maybe in the next uh, sermon on this particular subject, a little bit more, particularly in the book of John, about those things that we ask of God. But we need to ask in faith, believing. And that gets into the area of faith, which is, uh, of course, another subject, obviously. So we have to go to God with faith, or in faith. Now, there's another point that we need to understand is that we need to be persistent in prayer, or we need to keep at it. Let's notice the book of Luke to bring this out in one of the parables of Jesus, Luke 18. Luke 18, starting at verse 1. He spoke a parable unto them to this end, that men always, or ought always to pray and not to faint. Or we might uh, put it in other words, uh, that not to quit or give up. Men ought always to pray. He's not saying here now just occasionally, on a rare occasion that you pray, but you ought to always pray. You know, that's a regular, frequent thing. 
And to explain this now, he gives his parable, saying there was in a city a judge that feared not God, neither regarded man. And the, this is sometimes called the unjust judge. And uh, really it's representing uh, God, not that God is unjust, but the, the principle uh, here that he brings out shows our relationship, what it should be, to God. But this man didn't fear God, nor regard man. You know, he was sort of a law unto himself, and uh, he didn't have a, a high opinion of anybody else. He always looked down on others and uh, wasn't concerned about other people, and uh, he, he wasn't even afraid of God. Maybe he thought there was no God, I don't know. And there was a widow in that city, and it seems like widows uh, generally are not very well received by judges and by many others. And she came unto him saying, Avenge me of my adversary. So she had a problem, somebody was taking advantage of her, and uh, there was an adversary doing evil things to her, and so she says, Avenge me of my adversary. And uh, apparently the only way she could get relief was through the judge. And he would not for a while. And he thought and said, well now, you know, here's this, this widow. I don't care about her. I'm not concerned about her. I'm only concerned about myself. But afterward he said within himself, though I fear not God nor regard man, and apparently he's rather proud of this, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And so he realized she's going to come back every day, every week, every month, or whatever, and uh, bother him and uh, uh, trouble him, and he didn't want to be bothered. And so he said, well, I'll just take care of this right now so that she won't come around and needle me anymore. And the Eternal said, hear what the unjust judge says, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with him? So he's saying, won't God in due time act for those of his elect, those of his saints, which cry day and night unto him. You know, not those that cry unto him once a year when they get in a mess, but that cry unto him day and night. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth. Now, obviously, this, this widow here, with her importunity, with her coming back again and again, with her persistence, she had faith, but it seems like there's not very much faith in the world today. So at this point, then, we need to be persistent. And so if God doesn't answer your prayer on the first day, we'll continue. You know, pray about that same thing tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day, until God answers your prayer. Now, continuing on the other points, how to pray. Well... We can pray privately. That's, now, there are different uh, ways of praying. We can pray privately. We can pray publicly. Uh, we do have public prayers uh, here. Maybe I should say semi-public, since it's uh, at church services for the opening and the closing of our services. But, of course, that's not the kind of prayer that I'm emphasizing. I'm talking about the regular, daily prayer that we all should have, our time of prayer to God. And Matthew 6.6 6 tells us how we should do this. Matthew 6.6. 6. And there's quite a bit about the subject of prayer in this little section in chapter 6, and we'll see more of that at a later time as well. But when you pray, enter into your closet. Or we might say a private place or a private room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your father which is in secret. And your father which sees you in secret shall reward you. Uh, the word openly is not in the modern translations, but obviously if God's going to reward you, it will be open. Even though apparently that's not in the Greek here. But the point is that you should pray to God in private. That's where most of our prayer should be. Now, this is exclusive of any public prayer or any family prayer. These are different subjects, which I'm not covering. Uh, that type of prayer can be proper, depending on the circumstances. Uh, families uh, oftentimes pray together. And I'm sure you've all heard uh, or read the saying, you know, families that pray together stay together. together. I think that's a good principle. And uh, a family may pray together, led by the father or the head of the house. 
And uh, then maybe some others choose not to do that. There's no great command about it, but I, I think it can be a very uh, good thing for families to pray together, as far as that's concerned. But that's not the, the kind of prayer that I'm emphasizing and speaking about in general in this sermon. So we should pray privately. So when I'm talking about praying, I'm talking now about the regular daily prayer where we go to God in private and when we pray to him privately, all by ourselves. Now, there may be a, an occasion where this is impossible. Uh, when uh, people are traveling, maybe they don't have that opportunity to uh, pray privately. Maybe they have to pray while their husband or their wife uh, is in the same room. And uh, in such a case, that still can be done as far as that's concerned. It's necessary, but the normal routine thing is to pray separately, privately, by yourself in whatever place that might be, whether it's a closet or whether it's a bathroom or a bedroom or a living room or a garage or, uh, you know, whatever it might be. And each one of us have to uh, find where we can go and, and uh, close the door and uh, sort of be shut off from the rest of the world while we go to God in our prayer. And that's the kind of prayer that I'm generally talking about. Now, the next thing that I want to cover are the positions of prayer. You know, how... Do we pray to God? What is the usual, normal posture that we have when we go to God in prayer? Well, obviously that of kneeling. The usual position is that of kneeling, and you'll find many examples of that uh, in the Bible. And uh, if I uh, wanted to take the time, I could turn to several, probably dozens, uh, in fact, I'm sure dozens of places in both the Old and New Testament, and by the way, I have them all listed uh, in the, uh, one of the help that I have at home, uh, the places, the, the positions of prayer. Kneeling is one position, prostration is another, standing is another. And I'll even show you another one that we'll read a little bit later that might be rather surprising. You, know, you can pray in just about any position as far as that's concerned, but the normal routine of prayer is on our knees, you know, on two knees. Now they say, the Bible doesn't say this, but uh, they say that it's uh, proper to kneel before a king with one knee but on both knees when you come before God. Now, whether it's proper to uh, kneel on one knee before a king or a ruler, I don't know. I, beside the point, I don't know that I know one way or the other. I guess it wouldn't be wrong as far as that's concerned, but when we go to God in prayer, we ought to go on both knees. But you might say some people aren't able to uh, kneel on both knees, maybe because of physical infirmities. They're not able to do that. Well, then God understands that, and there are other uh, other. Uh, Positions of prayer, which uh, can be effective as well, as far as that's concerned. Another position is that of prostration, which is a, a form of kneeling, where you kneel and then you touch your head to the floor, or you bow your head clear to the floor, which is, I guess, sort of the common way the uh, Muslims pray, I think. Then I mentioned standing, and there are many examples of that also uh, in the Bible. But you can pray to God in any position, especially in emergency. The normal prayer, though, is on your knees. But in an emergency, you know, it doesn't matter where you are. I'm reminded here of a story that Mr. Dean Blackwell has uh, said on, or mentioned on a few occasions. There was a man who uh, fell down a well. This is a dug well. And he fell down head first. And uh, on the way down, somehow his foot caught on a projection. And here he was dangling by one foot upside down in the well. Now, what would you do in such a circumstance? Well, probably what this guy did. He prayed. And what did he pray about? Well, I, he prayed that he might be delivered from this terrible predicament, because maybe no one would go by there. He might even die before anyone found him down there in that well. And so he prayed that God might deliver him, and so God did send someone along, and the man found him and pulled him out. Now, the moral of this is that you can pray even upside down in a well. Now, that's not the normal, desirable place or way to pray, but you can pray anywhere at any time. Now, in the subject of prayer, as I've been covering it here, I've been talking mainly about the regular, maybe I can say formal prayer, and I don't know if that's quite the right word to use about the regular, routine, daily prayer. I'm not uh, including or discussing particularly the many short prayers that a person might pray, pray. You know, we can be in an attitude of prayer 
at all times as we go about our daily activities. But I'm not talking about that kind of prayer, you know. When we're talking about praying to God, that's not the kind necessarily we're talking about. When uh, someone hasn't been praying for a long time, you know, we're talking about people who haven't been praying down on their knees in a private place before God. I want to go back to uh, another example of prayer. I was talking about the posture of prayer. But an example back in First uh, Chronicles. First Chronicles. Chapter 17. In chapter 17, we find that David decided that he wanted to build a house to God. Let's start in verse 1. Now it came to pass, as David sat in his house, that David said to Nathan the prophet, Lo, I dwell in the house of cedars, but the ark of the covenant of the eternal remains under curtains, or in a tent. Then Nathan said unto David, Do all that is in your heart, for God is with you. So, in other words, he's saying, What I would like to do is to build a temple for God. And Nathan, God's prophet, said, Fine, go ahead and do whatever you have in mind. And it came to pass, the same night that the word of the Eternal came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell David my servant, Thus says the Eternal, You shall not build me a house to dwell in. And then he mentions here why, but... He says, instead of you building me a house, I'm going to build you a house. you notice that uh, at the end of verse 10. And uh, in verse 11, he goes on to explain how that uh, God was going to establish the kingdom through the descendants of David. Verse 2, speaking of of his son, uh, which turned out to be Solomon, He shall build me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. And he makes some other promises now in addition to this. And verse 15, well maybe we should read verse 14, And I will settle him in my house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forevermore. Talking about the throne of David through Solomon. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. And David came and sat before the eternal. And said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me here? And yet this is a small thing in your eyes, O God, for you also uh, have also spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come, and have regarded me according to the estate of a man of high degree, O eternal God. What can David speak more to you for the honor of your servant, for you know your servant? And then he mentions in verse 25 uh, about how he was praying before God. So here we see an occasion where David sat before God and prayed. Now, that wasn't his normal position of prayer, and we see more of that in in other places, but on this particular occasion he sat before God. Why, I don't know. But uh, this is a very important prayer and a very important occasion in uh, David's life. All right, now we've been seeing a little bit about how we should pray, the attitude we should have, some of the things that we should do as far as uh, where and uh, uh, position and so on. We'll see more related to this later. But next, what should we pray about? And when I first wrote out my notes here, I said, what should we pray for? And after a while, I realized that wasn't the right statement. What should we pray for? I think it's better, what should we pray about? When we think of praying for something, we think of that as asking But prayer isn't just a a lot of asking, you know, asking God for a whole lot of things. We can ask God for some things, but that isn't a major part of prayer. At least uh, when we ask about things for ourselves. In other words, is prayer the opportunity to uh, go to God with the gimme? Of course not. People with this concept of prayer, you know, just asking God for a lot of things, are ignorant and short-sighted as to the purpose of prayer and what we should be doing in prayer. Now, it is a time, prayer is, when we can ask, but what for? When you go to God to ask, what are you going to ask about? Now, the overall approach is given in what is called the Lord's Prayer. Now, you've all heard of the Lord's Prayer. It's almost as famous, I guess, as now I lay me down to sleep. (laughs) But, of course, 
God's prayers are not in the same category as that. Now, really, it's not the Lord's prayer. The Lord's prayer is uh, the prayer that he prayed, and uh, that primarily you'll find over in John 17, and also some of the succeeding chapters. That was what he prayed. But the Lord's prayer, as it is called, really teaches us how to pray and what to pray about. Now, if you'd like more information on this, we have had uh, articles in the Plain Truth on this subject. January 1963, Plain Truth had an article on page 23 on this subject about the Lord's Prayer. Let's turn to it in Matthew 6. It's also in some of the other Gospels, and from time to time I may refer to the other Gospels accounts where the words are slightly different and add a little bit to our understanding of it. Matthew 6. We've already seen a little bit about this in verse 6, about praying and going into our closet. Why don't we pick it up here in verse 7. But when you pray, it's not here if you pray, but when. Implying, of course, that we are going to pray. When you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. So we don't, God to, uh, we don't go to God in prayer and uh, just repeat a phrase or a sentence or a, a verse or something like that over and over and over again. It reminds me again of the prayer wheels of some of the Orientals, where they write prayers on a wheel and then they spin the wheel and they think that God is going to hear it because it's repeated so much. And there are other people who even repeat this so-called Lord's Prayer here, and it is repeated over and over and over again. And yet, right in the very place where you find it, he says, don't use vain repetitions, as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not you therefore like unto them, for your Father knows what things you have need of before you ask him. Now, God knows what you need, so why do you even ask him? Because he doesn't promise he's going to give you anything unless you first ask. We'll see more of that later also. After this manner, therefore, all right, he tells us now here not to repeat these words over and over and over again, but after this manner or in this manner or in this style or however you might want to say it, uh, you, we should pray. Now, what this is is not uh, a prayer that we should repeat word for word, but it tells us the kind of things to pray for, what to pray about. Now here we come to God, and we say, Our Father, Our Father. You don't say, well now, My Father. You say, Our Father, realizing that there are many other sons that also come to God in prayer, that we're not alone in this, but there are many others. Now, another point we might emphasize here is that we address our prayer to the Father, not to the Son, Jesus Christ. We do find an example or two where prayers were addressed to Jesus Christ on occasion. But normally, our prayer is to God, the Father. And in the name of, or by the authority of Jesus Christ, as other scriptures will show us. So we pray to our Father, who is, of course, the source of all life, all of our needs, of everything. Then it says here, which art in heaven. Which art in heaven. This shows us where God is located. He is in heaven, the capital of the universe. He is the one who has, that, you might say, the controls of the whole universe. The one who has all power. To the throne of God the Father and Jesus Christ seated at his right hand. Imagine, here we are coming into the very presence of God. Not only is Jesus Christ there, And the Father, but there are 24 elders that we find described over in Revelation. And also we find cherubim, four cherubim, at least there are four that are mentioned. There are four seraphim, millions of holy angels in this temple of God in heaven. We find that described in more detail in Revelation, the first chapter, Revelation, the 21st chapter, Ezekiel, the first chapter, and so on, which gives us sort of an insight of uh, what God's presence is like. And here we now come into God's presence having a private audience. And 
in personal conversation with that great God. You know, it's incredible that God would permit us to come to him and into his presence. And yet he has. In fact, not only has he given us that permission, we have been commanded to come to God in prayer. And imagine this. If you were going to have a private audience with a worldly ruler or some notable person, chances are they would do most of the talking. But in this case, you come before God's presence, the greatest individual in the whole universe, and you do all the talking. Maybe you never thought of it that way before. So we come to our Father, which are, or which is, in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Now this is the first thing to pray about. Hallowed be thy name. Now why is it that God's name should be hallowed? Because of who he is, because of his greatness, because of his power, because of his authority, because of his majesty, and his glory, and so forth. We want to hallow God's name but not that we only should hallow God's name, but we want everyone to hallow that name. And we are praying here that not only will I hallow your name, God, but all the other brethren in God's church, they might hallow your name. And that even though the world doesn't know about you now, that very shortly, that they will know about you, and, and everyone is going to hallow your name. We're praying that God might help us, and in due time the whole world, to learn to reverence God and his name. To regard his name with great respect. That his name might be used properly. That his name might be holy and sacred, instead of profane, as it is in the world today. Now, some, of course, think that God has only one name, and they make a whole religion almost out of that. And they think that we should pray using that particular name and refer to him by that name, Yahweh, I'm speaking of particularly. But they think that that's the only name God has. Well, God has many names. People think that God can only have one name. Now, maybe you can have three names or four names. And some people, illustrious people, have five, six, seven, eight names, I guess. But God can have more than one name, too. God has many names. Yahweh is just one name. Now, if someone came up to you and said, well, what's your name? You might give them all three or four or two or however many, many names you have. And you don't think of that as being plural, as though it is your names, it's your name. You know, it's uh, individual to you. Well, if you can have two or three or four names, then God also ought to be able to have more than one name and think of it in the singular. And there are just many, many, many names of God in the Bible, in both Old and New Testament. Some of them written in Hebrew, some of them written in Greek, some of them written in Aramaic. And we don't have to uh, refer to God by just the Hebrew name, or by the Greek name, or by the Aramaic name. But use the language in, in which we speak of God's name. <clears throat> so we can pray to God to start with, that we and others might hallow his name. Secondly, thy kingdom come. The next thing we should pray about, and as we'll see a little bit later, this is a daily prayer. Maybe we should just uh, look down in verse 11 to see that. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, doesn't that imply that it's a daily prayer? You know, if you skip a few days, uh, what are you going to do in the meantime? You know, you're not going to say, well, God, give me my uh, food for the next week, and then in a week from now I'm going to come and pray to you again. No, I think very obviously he's talking about a daily prayer, the kind of thing that we should be praying about every day. And the second thing is, after asking that and praying that God's name might be hallowed, we pray that his kingdom might come. When we look around the world today, as we read the newspapers and watch the news on television and see in the news magazines what's going on in the world, and when we see uh, other things from a personal vantage point of what's going on in the world, certainly the world's in a terrible mess. It seems like there are unending troubles because, of course, this is Satan's world. Satan has deceived the whole world. He has deceived the world into uh, all kinds of false religions, into violence, murder, suicide, all kinds of crime and corruption, bribery in government and every other place, sickness, misery, confusion, 
pollution, and you can go on and on and on and on and on of the very evils of this world. And as we see these things, and as we see sad things, and we see people that are suffering, those that are in pain or in mental turmoil or anguish and so on, can't we pray with enthusiasm that God's kingdom might come? With great zeal that God's kingdom might come? Praying for a change in this present evil world? Praying for the wonderful world tomorrow? Praying that God might grant us immortality? Or maybe you're not concerned about that. Maybe you think you're going to live forever in the flesh. Well, if we get a little bit earlier, or get a little bit older, <clears throat> I think we can <clears throat> more earnestly pray for that, that God might grant immortality to us, to his saints. And that's, of course, one of the promises that he has given us, that he's going to give us immortality, and then we won't hurt anymore, we won't have pain anymore, we won't be sick anymore. We're going to have vibrant health with great power and authority for all eternity. And no more weaknesses of the flesh. Can't we pray with enthusiasm that this kingdom might come and so that we might receive that great, incredible human potential that Mr. Armstrong has mentioned? That we might be born as sons in God's kingdom? That we might rule with the saints on the earth? We ought to be able to pray for this with great enthusiasm. And we ought to pray about it every day. And it seems like as the world gets worse and worse, we ought to be able to pray with more enthusiasm and with more zeal, with more energy, that God's kingdom might come. And it might come quickly. It would seem like in some respects, you know, that tomorrow's too late. You wish God's kingdom would come today. But we know from the prophecies that it'll be a few years yet. We don't know how many years, but at least there'll be a certain minimum number of years before the minimum prophecies could be fulfilled. So I would think we could pray, you know, that God might come at the very earliest possible moment. That he might intervene quickly in the affairs of the world and establish his kingdom and uh, bind Satan so that he will no longer deceive the people of the world and cause all the human misery and, and trouble that we have. Now we can also pray that the proclamation that this kingdom is going to come shortly, that this might now be preached to the world as a witness unto all nations so that the end can come. So we can pray a little bit about this work, you know, that it might be successful in proclaiming to the world these very important things. Now when you stop and think about it, about praying to the Father that first that we and others might hallow his name and that his kingdom might come, it seems to me that that would take us quite a while to pray about those things day by day. And yet we've just got started here on the things that we can pray about. These are just two of the main things that we can pray about as we come to God in our daily prayer. And yet some will say, you know, well, what can I pray about? I, I pray for a minute or two minutes or five minutes. The well is dry. I don't know what else to pray about. Well, I hope that I'm giving you sort of an insight here as to a lot of things you can pray about. And not only a lot of things you should can pray about, but that you should pray about. This aside from the things I've already mentioned about giving thanks to God. And when you start out in your prayer, you know, you can give a lot of thanks to God and then pray about these various things. So if you don't have enough to pray about, you're certainly very short-sighted and not understood the many things that the Bible tells us about prayer and what we can be praying about. If you still don't have enough to pray about, hopefully in a couple of weeks I'll give you a lot more things to pray about. Additional programs and literature available at hwalibrary.com.